Before even starting the story, though, like I guess the first point I want to make is that history doesn't always move in straight lines, you know? Uh, often you hear, when you look at the sort of colossal events that are unfolding uh, around the Middle East, or throughout Europe and so on, you know, sometimes you come across people that say, oh, you know, it can never happen here, there's nothing like that on our horizon. Well, I think the first lesson of the MUA dispute in 1998 is that sometimes you don't see things on the horizon. Some things, sometimes things are pretty much just about on top of you before you even notice that you're in the middle of a colossal struggle. And that's pretty much what it was like in 1998. Let me paint you a picture. 1983, the Labor government gets elected. Class struggle, with a few very honourable exceptions in Australia, class struggle goes into the deep freeze. Wage rises, conditions and so on, they're not something that you fight for on the job anymore, it's something that Bill Kelty and the ACTU and all of the you know, pack of union bureaucrats negotiates your latest pay cut on your behalf and you just sit there and take it. You know, the strike figures plummeted. We'd had 13 miserable years of Labor government with this sort of setup. When, uh, you know, in despair, people decided to vote Howard in 1996. And even the first vicious attacks, you know, every morning you'd wake up, turn the radio on and be another, you know, jackboot to the head. They're taking away what? They're doing what? That there was, like, there was some resistance. And uh, Davey was one of the people that, uh, you know, was part of the famous storming of Parliament uh, in 1996. There was some, you know, the real staunch resistance. But, you know, it wasn't generalised and there was this general air of resignation and defeat that we've just got to cop it. So if you'd said to me at the start of 1998... Jerem, within a couple of months, you're going to be standing side by side with thousands and thousands of workers on an illegal picket line. You will have built barricades in the streets of Melbourne. You will be holding to ransom one of the most strategic industries in the country, and you will stop the Howard government's union-busting agenda dead in your tracks. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know what I would have done. But... <laughs> so but, so that, that, I guess, is the story, uh, or a big part of the story that I'll tell. This is the scene on uh, the night of the Tuesday before Easter, April the 4th, 1998. Uh, Patrick Stevedores, one of the two big uh, waterfront uh, companies in Australia, had just sacked uh, 1,400 unionised uh, waterfront workers, wharfies. And they'd uh, been uh, chased off the, uh, the wharves with the uh, you know, goons, with, uh, with mace gas, with dogs. And uh, this fellow sitting in front of a Patrick Stevedores uh, little sign became the poster boy for... John Howard's industrial relations agenda in 1998 in the waterfront dispute. And um, there was a lot at stake in the financial review, certainly. Um, you know, like literally the government, Howard and Reith, his industrial relations minister, were high-fiving each other, backslapping each other, whooping it up on the floor of parliament. They thought the wharfies have been sacked, the union's broken, that's it, we've won. Um, and, you know, the financial review talked about it. I'm quoting, a brilliant, bold stroke that had changed everything between capital and labour in Australia. Capital is asserting its right to manage, um, and this is an exercise designed to impress Australian businesses and workers that the new world of industrial relations has arrived. This is the new world. And it went on. The pickets that I'll talk about later, according to the Financial Review in the early days, were the last gasps of a nation wrenching itself away from its past, a past which includes the state-enforced redistribution of the so-called living wage, you know. So, you know, that was what was at stake in 1998 in the waterfront dispute. It wasn't just a union, it was a whole agenda. It was a whole idea, um, you know, that the government was on the warpath about. So that's one side of the story, that's what they were on about. What they were up against was not just a union, but was actually a living, breathing reality of working class solidarity. Which, um, I still need the notes, even though that's there. So, yeah, I know, but you still need to attract my attention every five minutes. It hasn't been five yet. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's, yeah, yeah. Complete days. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the living, breathing reality of working class solidarity, which, you know, like, despite the sort of deep freeze of class struggle which had happened under the Labor government, you know, still existed and, and really made itself manifest. Part of the reason was their target, you know, like, it, it, it was, you know, the maritime union really is a, is a byword for solidarity. Uh, in Australian history. Going back to the 1890s, some of the most colossal uh, class struggles in Australian history were, were sparked when Sydney wharf labourers refused to load uh, wool that had been shorn by scab shearers during one of the great uh, 
uh, Shearer's strikes of the 1890s. And you can go right through, you know, the pig iron dispute in 1938 where Wolfies refused to loan, load pig iron for Japan that was being uh, used as bombs, you know, down on the people of China. Uh, 1967, the Dalfram dispute where uh, Wolfies refused to load barbed wire that was going to the Australian war effort in Vietnam. Uh, the bans against the apartheid regime in South Africa. The bans against Zim Line shipping, the Israeli owned shipping line. Thank you. Um, in 1982, following Israel's brutal invasion of southern Lebanon. In 1991, Melbourne Wolfies went out to stop rainforest timber from uh, Malaysia, um, you know, in solidarity with the indigenous people there, and so on, and so on, and so on. So by the time, um, you know, the Howard government got around to attacking the Wolfies, they had an awful lot of friends, and some of them started to turn up at the waterfront in scenes that look pretty much like this. It's a terrible photo, it's a terrible newspaper even. This, <laughs> this is basically, like, you know, it doesn't do justice, this is basically the entire uh, construction industry in the CBD, uh, the entire unionised workforce, turning up down to the docks the very day after um, those dramatic scenes on the docks. So what do you do when um, 1,400 wolfies get the sack? You set a picket line, a 44 gallon drum, a couple of blokes standing around, a couple of blokes sitting around, a couple of women sitting around. That's all, you know, of course there's kids involved because it's, you know, just about Easter time, everyone's on school holidays, so you set up a union crash. That's all, you know, when we talk about, you know, dramatic moments in the class trial, but a lot of the music is just, you know, just stopping shit from happening. There was a lot of this going on, but any dispute, um, any dispute will have its turning points. And, um, Oh yeah, well just to say about this, like even though it looks scrum, like I spent a lot of time down on the picket line, I've never, I've never worked as a warfare, I should make clear now, you know, so I'm not accused of anything, but I spent a lot of that time down in scenes like this just milling around, and you start talking to people and turn out, oh yeah, I'm from a warehouse out in Dandenong, there's 30 of us there, there's only 3 of us at the picket, but if anything happens, you know, we've got the phone, you know, everyone will come down, and every, just about every single person here was a delegate from some sort of workplace, so this was a scene, uh, on the Melbourne waterfront and pretty much around the country, in Sydney, in Perth, uh, less so in Brisbane, unfortunately. Um, you know, without hunt any hour of the day, you could go down to the waterfront, you would find hundreds or thousands of people just standing around showing their solidarity with the Wharfies. Any dispute has its turning points. This was one of them. This is uh, the second happened on the Tuesday before race day. My memory fails me whether uh, this was the Good Friday of that Easter or the Easter Saturday. But in any case, um, there's a whole bunch of containers behind this train, and it's trying to get into uh, uh, the Swanson Dock, just down the street here. Um, and a lot of the officials on the picket line are actually pretty hesitant about, oh, yeah, you know, actually standing on the train tracks and stopping the train, oh, jeez, I don't know. There was a lot of, like, all of this crowd, there's a lot of left-wing officials, uh, there's a lot of trade union, uh, you know, just rank-and-file trade unionists, there's a lot of socialists, just ordinary folk to society, and this really was the moment that the Melbourne picket, at least, became nothing in, nothing out. This is not just some token protest action we're going to, you know, grind our teeth while the trucks roll past, we are stopping this stuff from going on. And this is the moment where the train driver indicated that he was sick of sitting there as well, so he was clearing up. <laughs> and that was, a really, that was a really crucial thing. Of course, um, you know, that's when the state gets involved as well, because you're not allowed to do this stuff, you know, all of this stuff is against the law. So the uh, Patrick uh, boss's Chris Corrigan trundles down to the Supreme Court of Victoria and gets a court ban on the Wharfies. This is the scene in Fremantle on the same day. This is about, uh, what, you know, uh, 10, 11 days after the dispute had broken out. Well, this was happening. And the little headline here, Waterside workers are warned off Melbourne's docks, but unions say they will defy the law, you know, defy the injunction that the Supreme Court had issued. Even this was pretty contested, and I think this was really qualifies as a second turning point in the dispute. Um, throughout the dispute in Melbourne, there was, I think it was three uh, different delegates meetings. There was one particular delegates meeting at Dallas Brooks Hall, holds a couple of thousand, the thing was packed. Lee Hubbard, the then uh, uh, Secretary of Trades or Council, is chairing the meeting and he's saying, look, uh, we're encouraging people to go down there, but we're not encouraging people to defy the law, you know? And he was like, obviously trying to work this really complicated game in the head where he could keep his picket going but not actually say, go out and break the law. Susie Latham, a woman I know who at that time was in the International Socialist Organisation, she was a postal union delegate and she just gets up and says, well look, I'm prepared to defy the law. I think it's really important to defy the law. If that's what it takes to defend the Wharfies, I think it's more important to break the law than it is to, you know, let that union be broken. You know, hands up, who's prepared to break the law to, to you know, to stand up with the Wharfies? Who's prepared? You know, put your hand up. The entire room, thousands of people, it's kind of Lee Hubbard's. <laughs> At the next delegates meeting, it's Lee Hubbard saying, who's prepared to break the law? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, that's 
tell that story. It's a fantastic uh, dynamic. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Despite all of this going on on the um, the picket line, no, and this is the other thing, of course, that happens is the pickets got massively bigger as soon as the injunction was uh, was offered. Oh yeah, and the barricades. You know, what else do you do when you get an injunction on you to say no picketing? You start putting up barricades. Thank you. These are some qualified uh, uh, AMWU, the Manufacturing Workers Union, some uh, people welding together these uh, steel rails for the railways. Um, they, of course, they won't call barricades. They'll call community community sculptures. <laughs> Stop the um, stop the trucks from getting through. Of course, not all of us are qualified welders and so on, but everyone wants to be able to say, oh, "I built the barricade on the streets of Melbourne." So you know, there was a certain amount of just find any old stuff and <laughs> go into your bit. Okay. Now, all of this happening on the picket line didn't stop Patrick's from actually getting ships. Uh, didn't stop the ship the, the scabs from coming in because they were coming in by uh, boat to the dock. Uh, it didn't stop some ships being unloaded by their scab workforce on the docks. And it didn't stop uh, some of those ships being reloaded with some of the containers that they had there already. So this is just a few days into the dispute. And Patrick, the Stephen Doran Company, is saying, we've won. That's it. First time in 50 years we've loaded a ship without union labour in Australia. That's it. Done and dusted. Aren't we good? Now, little tip about the maritime industry, though. You can get a ship loaded and stuck, but then once it sails off, it's got to be unloaded somewhere. And this started to cause all sorts of problems. For, um, <laughs> because they found, and this became a really regular feature of the nightly news, you'd see uh, US wharfies marching up and down, you know, MUA, here the state, American accents, Japanese wharfies doing the same, Indonesian wharfies, uh, South African wharfies, um, but it was just extraordinary, the level of international solidarity in this very, obviously, internationalised uh, industry. The... Um, uh, there was one point at which it was, I think it was in the Australian newspaper, reported that uh, 10 million uh, unionised Indian railway workers had levied themselves 20 cents each, which works out to 2 million bucks for the strike fund for the, for the wharfies. So all of this is going on. You know that things are going pretty well. All sorts of people start turning up to the big... Oh, dear. She's gone. No. Technology is revolting. Unfortunately, this is a whole This is uh, on the picket line one day, and you know, you hadn't seen a politician for years, and all of a sudden there's about ten of them sort of standing like this, looking arms. You get the idea. Yeah. Will Kelty, ACTU secretary, blah blah blah. Julia Gillard, oh. ALP, ALP candidate for Labor, before she was in the parliament. As far as I know, the first and only time she's been on a picket line. So you know, when they want to jump on the bandwagon, you know that it's rolling pretty well. Okay. And of course, <laughs> yeah. it might be disturbing otherwise it's true. Okay. Um, and of course, all of you know, more and more, like business leaders were muttering and murmuring, and eventually starting to speak out quite explicitly, saying, "I think we're bitten off more than we can chew. This is looking like a total bloody disaster. Let's get the hell out." Okay. Um, all right. I have to tell the story of the long night. This, I forget what it was in the dispute, but the court went out. Every copper in Melbourne has, I believe, cancelled. Every copper in the country is coming to Melbourne, and uh, they're forming up down at the docks. So everyone scampers down there. This is one section of the crowd, and the crowd kept building, and the coppers kept building, and there was just this sort of standoff um, which developed. You get a little bit of a sense of it. This is a scene as night falls. You can see Melbourne in the background. You can see this first, this is all of us, you can see this first row of cops pretty easily. There's a whole other row there, and vans and all the vans and all of this sort of stuff. This standoff, like really I don't know how to describe, you know, you had to have been there all night, you know, with literally thousands of people from every walk of life, you know, chanting till your horse, um, you know, the police helicopter going overhead and shining a spotlight there. it's like you're in Apocalypse Now or something, <laughs> and you, you know, you're sort of bleary eyed from sleep, oh god, we're just hanging on, you know, what's the strategy here, we're just hanging on, we're hanging on. Just before, just around dawn, Martin Kingham, the State Secretary of the uh, Construction Union, the CFMU, gets up and he says, OK, it's a Saturday this morning, thousands of unionised construction workers are starting work in the CBD, just over there. All of my stewards are going to shut down the jobs and march them down to the dock. So, you know, reinforcements are coming. And I, like, I just cannot describe, like, looking at this scene, in the dawn light, seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of... Uh, construction workers walking around their corner and coming in to surround the police. <laughs> 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 and still, like, 
you know, one of the greatest moments of my life, you know, when you just know that we can do it, we are the power, you know, when the workers stand together, you know, yeah, you actually demonstrate in practice that we can conquer all of these cops, we can actually shut the thing down, um, you know, it's something that certainly has stayed with me uh, ever since. <laughs> this is the, uh, the cops firing out. <laughs> where I have to turn a bit and say, um, I might turn that off actually, yeah, yeah. just about, sort of done, that was probably the third turning point, the, the, the long, the long night, where, you know, it became clear that they just, you know, really, there would have been hell on, you know, like, the, Melbourne would have exploded, there would have been industrial mayhem, the ruling class would have lost badly, like, you know, Cooler heads prevailed and basically called the cops off. Turning point number four was the return to work. And this happened after about a month on the picket line. I think it was May the 7th that people marched into work. Throughout all of this action, there'd been this whole sort of complicated legal shenanigans going on. The Wharfies technically weren't sacked. Uh, Patrick's Chris Corrigan had restructured all of his company so that there was this shelf company that had no assets that employed all of his labour. He withdrew the contact from his stevedoring company to the labour provider, bang, the Wharfies are sacked. There's this whole complicated legal sort of thing that goes on the whole time and this insolvent company with no assets uh, that is the technical employer of, of the Wharfies. When eventually the Wharfies walk back in, they are still employed by that insolvent company. They end up working, okay, negotiate, the wharfies are back, docks are working, all the containers that are built up are starting to flow across. The wharfies still aren't being paid. They're, they're basically living on strike pay. And this drags on for month after month after month with these complicated negotiations going on behind the scenes. The whole dispute is out of the public eye. Um, you know, we're off the streets, we don't have any leverage uh, on, on, on the company and so on. And the result... Uh, when was it? In August, I think. Like it was, you know, three months afterwards. The result gets unveiled. Okay, this is the official come. This is what we've negotiated for you. The MUA is retained on the docks. You know, they haven't succeeded in, in wiping the docks of the union. But every single demand that Chris Corrigan's Patrick Corporation made for changes in work conditions, every single demand was met by the union officials. Uh, supposed non-core functions were outsourced, like cleaning, maintenance, security, and so on. Uh, the, probably the most important thing was the abolition of, uh, of two, two worker, two man operation of those giant strip straddle cranes that you can see down on the docks. All of this meant that uh, of the total Patrick's workforce of something like 1,400, by September, 763 had received redundancy packages. So it's just the most sickening and shocking result. It didn't happen without opposition. It took, it took the officials, you know, everything that they had for eight hours. It was an eight hour meeting in Melbourne before the officials could finally bludgeon this, this rotten deal through. In Sydney it went through quicker but it started to fall apart on the job when people realised what, what it actually meant and so on. So, you know, that politics that had led to the accord that had put class struggle in the deep freeze, this was still dominant in the upper reaches of the union movement and actually, you know, a fair bit, uh, you know, not just in the upper regions as well. So, in, in the big picture, in terms of how it's union busting agenda, yes, we won a victory, but it was a very hollow victory for so many waterfront workers. I've worked in construction for most of the last you know, 12, 13 years, and I've worked with a few ex warfies that will tell the tale of, you know, you're standing in the, or sitting in this straddle crane, it's a work process designed to screw your back up if you're doing it continuously for eight hours. When it was one up, one down, two man operation, it was a different story. It's just the casualisation. There's a fellow I know around, to, after nine years as a casual on the docks, he finally got an interview as a permanent worker. You know, it's just, and this is in 2006, he finally got his interview. Shocking. Was there an alternative? Yes, there was. Exhibit A, that's my only exhibit really, <laughs> for the, um, the case that there was an alternative. This is a copy of the Tribune, the Communist Party newspaper from May 1969. And that uh, is historic strike wave defies penal system. This was, I'll pass around, just take a little bit of care with it. Claire O'Shea, the leader of the Tramways Union, had been fined and then jailed for refusing to pay a fine, basically, for an illegal strike. Basically, all the strikes were illegal back then, same as today. But rather than sort of passively submitting, pay the fine and all the rest of it, there was an attitude of defiance, there was organisation for defiance. 
there was a mass feeling for defiance and a, a rolling general strike rolled around the country that smashed these penal powers. They stayed on the books for a long time. Are they still on the books, Liz? Yeah. But, you no, know, I think it's been changed. Yeah, but you know, for years they were still on the books, but the ruling class was too shit-scared to use their own law to prosecute a union. And it was in this area after this strike, in, in this era after this strike, that actually Australian unions won some of the really you know, quite decent conditions that they won for working class people in this country. So there was another option. That feeling for uh, widespread solidarity action was there. Even the Australian Workers' Union, thank you, the acting national secretary, the Australian Workers' Union is not renowned for its uh, militancy, to put it mildly. Even the Australian Workers' Union was, was saying, we're prepared to take the oil refineries out on strike um, you know, if the wharfies ask us. Like, you know, the potential was there to smash all of the anti-union laws that have been built up over decades. This was an opportunity that was totally squandered by our union leaders. The reasons for that, well, you could do a whole, you know, different sort of talk on the compromised position of union officials, how they become professional negotiators, professional compromises, and therefore adopt a politics of negotiation and compromise rather than one of struggle. But I might leave the, um, the last word, I'll leave the last word to Warfie, but in terms of conclusions, like, what, maybe the best, what, one of the best sort of, you know, simple little formulations about the attitude to our officials uh, actually comes from Glasgow workers in 1915 on a cloak. And it was this. We will support the officials just so long as they rightly represent the workers, but we will act independently immediately they misrepresent them. And that's a very simple statement, but it's one that's actually very hard to put into effect. And so I'd recommend, you know, like I know there's comrades here from New Zealand who are going through, you know, lockouts and disputes and whatever. I know there's comrades here from the Philippines who are doing the same. We're going to be meeting some of these very same officials, you know, up in Sydney next week and so on. I'd say, of course... We want them on board. Of course, accept, accept their support. It's crucial. But keep control of your dispute. And you know, the rank and file must have control of that dispute. As soon as you let the, the professional compromises and the professional negotiators um, you know, call the shots, well, that's when things can start to turn pretty bad. I'll leave the very last word to uh, a fellow, uh, Bob Carnegie. He was at that time the elected MUA organiser up in Brisbane. He still runs a really interesting blog, actually, um, which I found the other week. Uh, on the waterfront in the MUA and so on, um, but this is what he said at the conclusion of the dispute. It was not the Federal, Supreme or High Court of Australia that held firm on the picket lines, night and day, in bad weather and fair. It was working people of principle. It is my belief that this nation's union movement, supported internationally, could have defeated Corrigan and Reith. But in the end, the minimalist line, which so typifies the Kelty years of dispute handling, was followed to contain at all costs workers fighting together for a better future and to prevent at all costs workers believing in each other. The struggle happens, sometimes it lands on top of us, but how far it gets really crucially depends on how well we're organised, what sort of politics we have. I'll leave it there.